Welcome to another episode of The Brand Called You, a podcast and podcast show that brings you leadership lessons, knowledge, experience, and wisdom from hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. I am your host, Ashutosh Garg, and today I'm privileged to welcome an individual who the famous Philip Kotler once called the father of modern branding. Mr. David Acker. David, welcome to the show. Thank you. So glad to be here. Uh, David is the vice chairman of Profit Brand Strategy. He is a former executive advisor to Dentsu Inc. He's written 18 books and hundreds of published articles in prestigious journals all over the world. He has been awarded five career awards, including the NYAMA, NYAMA Marketing Hall of Fame. He's a former ed member of the editorial board of several publications. And I just, as, as I mentioned in my introduction, Philip Kotler once called him the father of modern branding. So David, with that kind of a track record, it's such a privilege to speak to you. Let's speak about branding and profit brand strategy. Tell me the work you do as a profit. Well, my role at Profit, which I've been with them now for 21 years, I left academia, University of California, at that time to join Profit to get my ideas more, uh, um, more penetration into the business world. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, Profit has now expanded greatly. They, they uh, were very on focus on brand strategy using a lot of my models mm -hmm. and they still do that, but now they've expanded to cover uh, design and, and digital transformation and customer experience and uh, analytics and, and uh, corporate culture. Mm -hmm. So they have quite a large uh, a portfolio now, but, but branding is still their lead, uh, the, the lead uh, product they have. But my role at Profit has always been to basically sit in the corner and write books mm -hmm. and to do blogging. So I've done about three, 350 blogs, and I've written, uh, since I got to Profit, four or five books, and, uh, uh, and they add them to the intellectual capital of, of, of Profit. Mm -hmm. So let me start by asking you a question that a lot of young people often ask me. Is marketing a science or an art? Well, it's both. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's one of the things that Profit uh, we emphasize is that uh, we have a creative side and an art side a judgment side, a subjective side. Um, and, uh, and actually we, we had one time purchased a creativity company called play. Okay. And we use a lot of their techniques to, uh, to be creative. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of art and judgment instinct to a marketing, but there's also science and, uh, so especially in segmentation, in, uh, in uh, setting uh, priorities, you need to study the marketplace quantitatively. Mm -hmm. And we are now in the era of big data. And so uh, that's something that is, is really a must have for a marketing practitioner. Mm, fascinating. And with so many years of advising companies on branding, my question to you, David, is what goes into building a successful brand? Well, that's a, a really good question. And uh, it, uh, it, the answer to what makes a successful anything mm -hmm. is almost always multidimensional. Right. And it's almost always longitudinal, which means that it, it evolves over time. Mm -hmm. But it, it starts with something that's really worth branding. Mm -hmm. uh, unless you have something that's worth uh, spending resources on, uh, on creating, making people aware, and so on, then, uh, uh, then you, you shouldn't put a brand on it. Mm -hmm. So it, it all depends on the substance, the idea that's worth branding. It should be something that is really going to uh, uh, be something that's sought after something that's unusual, something that's new, something that really makes a difference. And uh, that's where it all starts. Okay. If, if, if you don't have uh, something to brand, it's not gonna help. Mm. And the second thing is then you have to understand what the brand stands for. Mm. 
And I call that a, a brand identity, uh, I, it, or now I call it brand vision. But you have to uh, try to understand the uh, the three or four or five things, mm -hmm. the pillars of the brand, the, the brand that what you want people, employees and other people to know when they hear your brand name mm -hmm. um, mentioned. And uh, and then there in my my uh, my belief is that you even have another three or four that are sort of uh, a little bit less priority, but they're still useful in explaining the brand. Mm. And then the third thing is you've got to bring those things in life. You've got to give them substance mm -hmm. in the marketplace. They're just not vaporware. And you have to figure ways to communicate them. Right. And uh, uh, so at least those are, are three major uh, things you look for in, in, what, in a strong brand. Amazing. And a follow-up question to, uh, to your response would be that what makes a brand stay relevant for a very, very long period of time? I mean, there are some brands that have survived 100 years and some die uh, in a few years. Yes. What, what well, I wrote a book called Brand Relevance in okay. which I talked about the, the threats to brand relevance. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, one threat is that you simply lose energy. Mm -hmm. You are uh, your grandfather's brand. You are yesterday's brand. Your your brand is just terrific. But but uh, I'm young and innovative and and have personality and it's it doesn't fit me. Mm -hmm. So uh, your your every brand needs to keep energy in order to stay relevant. Mm -hmm. um, another thing that makes you relevant is you somehow develop a reason not to buy. Okay. Maybe if you're you're Walmart, you you mistreated your your employees or something, and people started to not like you. Mm -hmm. Or if you're uh, uh, somebody that ignored the the climate change problem and uh, and and continued to have bad practices, there might be a reason not to buy. Mm -hmm. So that's the second thing you have to worry about: reasons not to buy develop. Right. And, and the third thing, and the most in, in common and insidious, is that you are doing great. You've got a great brand. You've got a great product. Everybody loves it. And uh, But they're not buying it anymore. Mm -hmm. You can have the best, uh, you know, uh, um, uh, you know, the best uh, 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 hybrid in the world. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, Everybody loves your hybrid, the Prius. They wouldn't buy anything else. They recommend it to all their friends, but then mm -hmm. now they're going to buy an electric car. Correct. It doesn't matter how much they like your Prius. Mm -hmm. It just doesn't matter. Well, they certainly. can be at, as you can have a hundred percent loyalty. Mm -hmm. So much so loyal they'll tell others about it. Mm -hmm. But if they're buying now an electric car, it just doesn't matter. Correct. And and then you then you lose relevance. So it's the, the lesson is you have to strive to be the one that's developing the new subcategory and owning that being the exemplar brand. Mm -hmm. And two, if you can't do that, at least you've got to make sure you're relevant to whoever has established those new categories. Fantastic. And therefore, when if you look at today, where, you know, when I started working in branding, that was 45 years ago, uh, the entire paradigm has changed with the onset of technology, digitization, um, the devices that we are working on from billboards to small little handheld devices. How do brands stay relevant in a digital world? Well, it, it comes back to uh, the latest book I wrote is called Owning Game Changing Subcategories. Mm -hmm. and, and the theory of this book is the only way to grow is to innovate, create um, subcategories that are defined in some new must-haves that mm -hmm. either improve the uh, the uh, buying and use experience or create a new uh, a way to relate to the brand mm -hmm. customer relationship, um, and uh, and and that's sort of the only way to go. So, if you look at that, you, you make the following observation: that's is true today, and it's always been true. Mm -hmm. But what digital has done. Mm -hmm. is to put that whole process on steroids. Okay. There's now more of these. They're more frequent. Mm -hmm. They have higher impact. And they come to fruition faster. 
And digital is behind that because first of all, digital has the internet of things. Mm -hmm. So you've got uh, all kinds of new products and concepts and services that are enabled by that. Mm -hmm. and there's, there's computer chips in cars, there's computer chips on clothing, there's uh, uh, digital temperature. That, yeah. and, and so anyway, the, digital, the internet of things allows more things. The second thing is, you know, it used to be, uh, and you'll remember this not too long ago, really in the in the in the you know the millennium. millennium the uh, it, it took nine months and twenty million hours to tell somebody what you're doing. <laughs> yes. And now with uh, the social media, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, there's a company called Dollar Shave Club that sells razors through e-commerce. Mm -hmm. They put on a three-minute uh, video. Mm -hmm. And 48 hours later, they had 12,000 subscribers, and that company was sold four years later for a billion dollars to Unilever. Correct. You, and, and, and then if you wanted to get your product distributed, mm. even 25 years ago, you had to had, had convince a retailer to put it in their shop. Correct. Or you had to create a whole new chain of retailers. True. Now you have e-commerce. And, and Dollar Shave Club was in the marketplace, you know, four days after they announced their product. Mm. You could buy it on the marketplace. Yeah. They didn't have to, you know, convince retailers. They didn't have to create a new chain. Mm. So it's uh, it's making a huge, huge difference. Fantastic. And, you know, your response is uh, giving me an interesting segue to my next question, which is how the traditional distribution channels, though they do exist, the entire paradigm has changed with the uh, availability of organizations like Amazon, which have now actually brought brands into people's homes. What is that doing to branding and to brand managers? Well, I think brands are even more important today than they ever were. Mm -hmm. um, because, uh, uh, in part because of the Amazon experience, what's really interesting about Amazon Mm. It, 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 it has a set of assets that are just so impressive. Correct. They, they, you can buy so conveniently. It's so reliable. It's yeah. so convenient. Mm. But um, there are companies that have been very successful at competing against Amazon, mm. e-commerce companies. Mm. And what they do is uh, uh, there are several routes. One, they can have a personality. Mm -hmm. They can be the feisty underdog. They can be humorous. They can ridicule. Mm -hmm. Amazon can't do that. Correct. Uh, like Dollar Shave Club, they, that's one of their routes. They had a personality. Second, you can have a passion for what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Like there's a, a company that sells mattresses called uh, Casper, and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and they are passionate about sleep. Okay. And they know all about sleep. And if you want to know about sleep, you can interact with Casper. Mm -hmm. Amazon doesn't care about sleeping. They're just selling mattresses. Correct. Every single product category they're in, they're just a uh, uh, somebody that's conveniently selling you that product. Mm -hmm. They don't care about the product. They, they don't care about the application anyway. They sure don't care about that at all. Correct. They don't even care about the product. Mm. It's just a transactional relationship. So you can have some depth of things if you're, you can be the feisty underdog. Everybody loves the underdog. Mm. And you're competing against Amazon. Everybody with roots for, for, uh, for the underdog. Right. And, uh, and so uh, anyway, in my book, uh, the subcategory book, I talk about six or seven ways you can compete mm -hmm. against Amazon. Amazing. And you know, uh, yet because of the last 18, 20 months of the pandemic and most people working from home, I'd love to get your perspective on what has that done to brands or have people actually started moving to whatever they can get? What's it, it's done to what? To brands. Oh, to brands. Hmm. Um, well, again, I think that brands are, are more important than ever because... Uh, it's true that you can uh, uh, do research on information uh, about brands more than you could before. But, uh, but first of all, 
who wants to do that? Mm -hmm. Most people are, are, have got other better things to do. Correct. And second of all, even if you do it, you have to decide which brands to consider. Mm -hmm. And that's a branding issue. If your brand is not, um, you know, top of mind or in a consideration set because it's 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 relevant which means two things it's got to, people have got to be aware of it mm -hmm. and people have got to think it's credible mm -hmm. a credible option correct and if you're not aware and credible you're not going to win in any marketplace mm -hmm. and so that's that's a branding issue you have to you know achieve that that sort of thing mm. well said how have you seen technology change branding oh i see well i i i believe that the branding is basically the principles are the same mm -hmm. you have to decide what you want to stand for it has to be based on something with real substance mm -hmm. it has to be differentiating it, it has to be resonate with the customers it has mm -hmm. to be something you can deliver mm -hmm. credibly right and that hasn't changed Okay. And and the tasks of branding haven't changed either. You have to somehow communicate that, mm -hmm. um, not only with real stuff, but real substance, but you have to communicate it in some way that people are are um, are, are willing to listen mm -hmm. and that they're willing to accept information. And uh, and that's uh, I think that uh, one thing in this digital age mm -hmm. stories are more important than anything i wrote another book on stories right that explains why mm -hmm. um because most information today is either ignored or argued against and mm -hmm. uh stories are uh, an outlet mm -hmm. um and of course the digital means e-commerce and social media mm -hmm. and those things as we've already mentioned have a uh, have uh, have changed some of the things you do but not really the fundamentals fascinating so david i've got time for two or three more questions my next question is on analytics you did speak about analytics in the beginning of our conversation but how have you seen analytics being used in building brands well <clears throat> i think that that most large companies now the marketing department has a strong analytics group. Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of something that's necessary because of the big data phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I think that comes with some some risks because uh, the last time we had this big data avalanche and analytics came to the fore mm -hmm. was when we had scanner data that was in the 80s. Mm -hmm. And what that did was to lead people to scientifically study what prompts sales. And what they found was price reductions and price deals made sales go up. Okay. So everybody diverted marketing, brand building resources to price reduction promotions mm -hmm. and brands were destroyed. Okay. And furthermore, they, they, there was no real growth. Mm -hmm. It was just some market churn. And it took, uh, when they realized that, it took years to bring back the brands. Mm. And so I worry a little bit about analytics will focus too much attention on short-term things like sales and uh, and store traffic and, and so forth, or traffic to websites. And uh, and that will precipitate some, mm. some strategically disadvantaged decisions. So, I, I think that big data has got some opportunities, but also some risks. Fascinating. So my next question relates to ESG. Everyone's now talking ESG and it's become a buzzword in every boardroom. What are your views on ESG for brands? Well, I'm just finishing a book on ESG and branding mm -hmm. and, um, uh, I, I'm, my book will focus on the S in the ESG, and and uh, it has a couple of premises. the The first one is that um, you know the battle for the soul of capitalism is over, mm -hmm. and the stakeholder model won over the shareholder model, and and uh, so we're now off to how do we implement uh, the world in that in that context. The second thing is that what you need to do is to uh, 
create some signature social programs that can kind of carry the flag right. and use them to enhance the, a, a business brand, mm. to improve its, uh, its relevance, to improve its image, to improve, its, improve the loyalty of its customers. Mm. Because you, you need to do that because if the social program is off an orphan off by itself, mm -hmm. it'll have trouble maintaining long-term commitment from the organization. Hmm. And uh, second of all, if it's if it's integrated into the organization, I'll have access to all kinds of assets and expertise and knowledge that will make it a better social program. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the third premise of the book is the social program, whether it's inside the organization or an external one, mm -hmm. will benefit from branding. And most people that run social programs now are are not uh well versed in branding they don't have the resources to do branding well mm -hmm. and so they could benefit from a more intimate knowledge of what branding tools and concepts could help them wonderful and david my last question to you is about the millennials and the gen z's you and i have uh, you know similar vintage we have worked people across the ages over the last four or five decades. And yet today's world is being inherited by the young who are who'll hopefully do a better job on managing the earth than we have done. How are the millennials and Gen Z's, in your opinion, changing brands and branding? Well, the uh, one thing for sure is they are, uh, they're, they're, they're much more concerned with, you know, um, ESG than than uh, the 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 older workforce is, especially Gen Z. Mm -hmm. The uh, if you look at the results of of surveys that have done on questions like would you join this firm uh, if uh, or would you stay with this firm or um, or so on, they are <coughs> just look. It's overwhelming. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, well, it's very high in the millennial space, but in the Gen Z space, it's it's really, I mean, they just aren't going to go to work for companies that are in the business of of owning, of making profits for shareholders. Mm, very interesting. Uh, David, on that note, I just want to thank you. Uh, it's been such an honor speaking to you. Uh, I'm sure all our viewers and listeners have learned a lot from our conversation. And this is for all the people. Look for David's books on Amazon. He's got 18 books. He's got a new one coming out on ESG. David, thank you again for taking me through such an incredible journey on branding and for sharing your vast knowledge on branding. Thank you again and good luck. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Thank you for listening to the Brand Called You videocast and podcast platform that brings you knowledge, experience and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website www.tbcy.in to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Just search for the brand called you.